I have to take my hat off to Plato. He was a genius. He was uh, but a rather dark genius. And uh, we can really blame all of our belief systems on him. Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. I'm Harrison Cayley. Joining me in the studio is Adam Daniels. And today we are pleased to have joining us Russell Gamirkin. Now, for those of us, for those of you who were listening to us before we were on YouTube, uh, when I was doing a show, Truth Perspective, we interviewed Russell. It's probably, probably around five years ago now. Um, it might have been right when this book came out. This is Russell's last book, Plato and the Creation of the Hebrew Bible. It came out in 2016, I believe, 20, yeah, 2017. 2017 is the copyright, but uh, yeah. Right, so it may have it may have been four years ago that we we might have been interviewed in twenty seventeen, but it may have been twenty sixteen. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> but you have uh, for those of you for those of our viewers and listeners who haven't seen that, I'll just I'll recommend that interview that we did, and I'll give a link to your website, which has um, a rundown of all your latest interviews. You've done some great ones with Derek on Myth Vision and some other channels. So I'll recommend those to get into a lot of the, the nitty gritty of your books, your previous books, because you have one before this, um, Barosis in Genesis and Manitho in Exodus. Is that the name mm -hmm. of the first one? Yeah. Yes. Referred to as the green book. Yeah. And uh, because the book is green. Now, the, the, the one downside is that these are academic, published with academic presses, so they're very expensive, but they're worth it if you, uh, if you're into this sort of thing, biblical criticism and really, really cool ideas. I have to say this is the this is the time for some shameless flattery because uh, you are my favorite um, biblical author. Oh my and gosh. Uh, yes, I like I, I mean I, I'm not I'm not an academic myself. I haven't read everything, of course, but I've got a I've got a bookshelf with probably more books than the average person on these subjects. And um, so out of out of those guys, I, I like I like you the best because for no, for a number of reasons. One, your ideas are very cool. Like they're very radical and interesting and um, new. And your writing is very clear. You make sure every sentence makes sense. Every paragraph makes sense. Everything fits together. And um, yeah, just <laughs> maybe we can get into a bit about what makes you, uh, your take so unique. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a summary and then you can correct me and go, go on from there, Russell. Mm -hmm. So in your two books, you have argued for a, a new dating for the Pentateuch. So the, the earliest, the, the earliest version of the Bible, essentially the old Testament, the Hebrew Bible for years, it has been thought that either it was composed by Moses himself, of course, the Pentateuch, mm -hmm. and then slowly over over the centuries, and over, especially over the last two centuries, the, the dates have kind of slowly moved forward. So maybe it wasn't in the time of Moses, maybe it was in, um, maybe it was the time of the exile, or even before then, or maybe a, a bit after then, And but you, you come along and say, well, hold on a second, you know, something ain't right. So... The, the earliest evidence we can find of any of these writings is all Hellenistic era. There's no solid, solid, um, no solid textual evidence or any kind of evidence, archaeological, to show that there were these writings before the Hellenistic period. So this is the time right after Alexander, about 300 BC. And so when you look at, when you look at the actual evidence, the, the it, it all starts, all this, all, it all kind of lines up, it all the, the first hints of it appear around like 270 BC. And so, well, that's the short summary. Let me know if I, if I got that right. And then um, maybe could you just expand on what that means for, for the Bible and what that means for like the, the field of uh, like Bible studies or the study of the old Testament? Yeah. The, um, the first evidence for the books of Moses uh, is actually uh, is translation into Greek around 270 BC, the Septuagint translation. Up till then, there's no external references to any biblical writing. After that, there's just an explosion of uh, material related to uh, the Hebrew Bible. You've got uh, 
to a uh, pseudepigrapha, you've got the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've got references in literature. Um, so, so that's a bright dividing line in terms of when we actually know for certain that the books of Moses were written. Now, if you go back to, uh, say, 400 BC, you have the Elephantine Papyri, um, which, according to standard scholarship, I mean, 20th century scholarship, uh, the books of Moses were, by all accounts, completed by then. And yet, with the Elephantine literature, there's no reference to Moses or Aaron or any biblical figure. Um, they, someone threatened to uh, murder an employee if they didn't uh, pick up the vegetables on a Saturday. Um, um, there's, um, they're in contact with Jerusalem, uh, asking uh, the authorities in Jerusalem and Samaria, they destroyed our local temple. Can we rebuild a temple of Yahweh, an elephant team? So, you know, this is all very loud, strong, clear evidence that there weren't mosaic writings as late as, uh, you know, the end of the Persian era. Um, and so the Hellenistic era is, um, is where the first evidence comes in. Uh, and it's just been, um, it's been excluded by naked assumption uh, by scholars until, say, the 1990s. Uh, it was just inconceivable that that these uh, that the books of Moses could have been written that late. As a result of that uh, assumption, um, all the evidence for the uh, for the Greek background of the books of Moses and other parts of the Bible they were just ignored because uh, uh, it was all by uh, a priori uh, assumption that uh, it's inconceivable that. Uh, they could have been written, you know. Uh, but um, there's Greek evidence everywhere, uh, especially in the Pentateuch. You have uh, a very typical Greek foundation story. You have land promises to the ancestors, um, like Hercules was promised by the gods that he would eventually rule all of these areas. Um, and then you have generations later, you have uh, a colonizing expedition from the descendants of that figure uh, that uh, migrated and conquered a land by war and had all sorts of difficulties and uh, uh, and founded a new nation. And as a typical feature of that, um, you have uh, the the expedition leader. Uh, creates uh, a constitution and laws for the new nation and reads them and makes everyone swear to obey them. And that's, you know, that's exactly the plot of uh, Exodus through Joshua, really. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's many other examples that could be given. Uh, the books of Moses are, are just rich with, uh, with Greek materials. And, um, and it was all ignored because uh, that was considered too late. It was impossibly late. Mm -hmm. Well, and it wasn't, well, I, I would, I, I'll just, I'll disagree on a, I'll kind of okay. disagree because yeah. um, I know you'll, I know you'll agree with me just the way I phrase it. It's, it's not that it was ignored. It was just interpreted in an entirely opposite way. Right. So for, so ever since I think, I think this might be exaggerating, but almost ever since that first evidence for the, for the Pentateuch, there's, there have been arguments from both Jewish scholars and Christian scholars that the, the parallels suggest that the Greeks copied the 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 Jews essentially. That's true. That's right. true. Yeah. So, so so a lot of these. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I mean, this is a logic that you see in Josephus and uh, m many places. Everyone um, acknowledged that the books of Moses were written like a thousand BC. Um, you know, the Jews acknowledge that, the Christians, the Greeks, the Romans. And on the other hand, there were all sorts of amazing legal parallels with Plato's laws and with Athenian laws, and uh, so, and who were centuries later. And so, 
um, you know, Josephus and Eusebius and all the others that, well, you know, uh, the, you have a clear inference that uh, the Greeks copied Moses, that uh, somehow, uh, you know, Plato got a hold of uh, a copy of the books of Moses. And uh, I don't know if he was reading it in Hebrew or got a translation, but uh, there's no other explanation, but that, uh, you know, Moses copied Plato, uh, Plato copied Moses, uh, but you know we we now finally consider the alternate possibility that um, Moses copied Plato on these matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, not literally, but the authors of the books yeah. of Moses uh, had access to all sorts of Greek uh, legal materials and uh, mm -hmm. used it to create the Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting. Uh... It makes so much more sense when you think about it. Um, when you look at the way that you laid everything out, it just makes sense. Like the the way that Plato described what it would look like in order for a republic to have its own founding story and and how to best go about doing that. Uh, it doesn't really make much sense that there's not anything before that referring to. I mean, if the Bible is where he, or if the Pentateuch is where he got these ideas from, it wouldn't make sense that anybody else, that no one else rather, uh, came up with any of the same ideas before him. But if you do it from the reverse angle or from the reverse of things where like, where Plato does give this idea of how to create a nation state and how to go about doing it in a very strong and compelling way. And these authors just happen to like, come up with a way of doing exactly what he's talking about. It makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Plato said that to found a nation, you should do lots of investigation in the law codes of other nations. Um, and, uh, and yet he said, when you create a new nation, you've got to convince everybody, the citizens, that these nations are ancient, that they're divinely given, uh, that they've been unchanged uh, since the dawn of time when they were given to the founding generation. You've got to sell them on that uh, or else, uh, uh, you know, your nation will not be successful. Um, so he advocated uh, extensive ongoing research in international law, but covertly by the ruling class, uh, but you don't let the general populace know that that's what you're doing. Um, and these people who go out to uh, other nations and investigate their law codes and bring back new information to use. Uh, when they came back, they had to uh, not only keep it a secret, but they had to tell everybody that their nation's laws were the best. Uh, on pain of death. So, uh, you know, he had a, a very uh, good program for not only um, generating uh, constitution and laws, but uh, selling it as uh, uh, given by a divine lawgiver like uh, Zeus or uh, Apollo uh, gave the laws to Crete and Sparta and other nations that were successful in having long-lived constitutions. Because uh, a lot of these Greek nation states, they believe that uh, their God had given them their laws. And so, uh, as Plato said, you know, there's this superstition that develops where you never want to give up that uh, those divine laws that are part of your heritage. You're very loyal to them. You've grown up with them. And uh, that psychology has, uh, uh, it was very successful among the ancient Greeks and it's been successful in the 2000 years ever since. So mm -hmm. uh, I have to take my hat off to Plato. He was a genius. He was uh, but a rather dark genius and uh, we can really blame all of our belief systems on him. <laughs> well, that's one of the, this is one of the interesting things I wanted to bring up about this whole dynamic, um, I want to make a few points. So first, this totally flips the, the, like all prior conceptions of the, the origin of the, of the Hebrew Bible, like on their head, of course. Now, so instead of, instead of 
the direction going from the, the Hebrew books to the Greeks. Now it's the Greeks or the Hebrews. But then very quickly after around 270 BC, when you argue the, the Pentateuch was composed and translated, very soon after that, like within a century, you have um, the, the situation with the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, where there's this this growth of the, uh, the, the Hellenistic Jews, and then you have this kind of nationalistic reaction to this, this rise in Hellenism, which, which seems very interesting in that the original influences for, for this religion, as it was in these centuries, was arguably Greek in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, so we almost have, a we almost have a conflict between two, two Hellenistic, like competing Judaisms or, or competing worldviews. Mm -hmm. So that's that's point number one. And then the, the second point is that we often, when we think about Western civilization, as you mentioned, all like pretty much all our ideas come from Plato. Well, it's been if we if we look at the the main components for Western civilization, I've I've seen a few different sources describe them as pretty much you've got Roman law, and Roman law came in in, mm -hmm. in two two periods. Like first the with the with the Roman Empire. Um, like all of Western Europe was under Roman law, but then when the empire died, Roman law disappeared. And then it was only in the, um, somewhere in the, I can't remember if it was the 12th or the 15, 12 or 1500s where Roman law got introduced again. And that kind of became the basis for, for European law. So you have Roman law, you have Greek philosophy and you have Christianity, which is, has its roots in Judaism. So you, you could, you could say you've got Judaism, Christianity, Greek philosophy and Roman law. And then when you look at the, the Greek influence, you not, you don't not only have the rediscovery of the classics and, and that, that influence, you have the influence from Christianity and the, the Greek elements that Christianity added onto itself, like through the, through the Neoplatonic like uh, philosophers and, and then through, um, uh, through Thomas Aquinas and his, his updating of Aristotle. But then when you go back and you look at Judaism, well, it's like, well, well now, now the root of, of Judaism and Christianity is actually also Greek. So you've got Plato, like at all of these stages coming in Plato and then the Romans just coming in and it's, uh, and so, um, so that's the point number two, just to, just and an let, observation on, yeah, go on. Let me, let me interject. Um, the Romans with their 12 tablets of Roman law, um, they sent ambassadors to, uh, to Athens, to Greece, to learn about Greek law codes, and they brought back uh, elements of the law code of Sol Solon. So um, really, Athens uh, and the Greeks, they were a model for Roman law as, as well. Uh, the, the Greeks were, they were geniuses. They were also you know, imperialists, you can criticize them for a lot of things, but uh, they were an amazing influence on human civilization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from from pretty much all angles. Yeah, I, I I hadn't even thought to mention the of the very obvious like Greek influence on on Roman civilization. And mm -hmm. even what we think of as Roman philosophy, I mean, it's not like, well, maybe I'll, I'll I might disparage the Romans a bit too much by saying that, you know, they were pretty much just using what they wanted from 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 Greece and adding their own elements to it like Greek Sto stole, I mean Roman stoicism from the best you have to respect yeah. that yeah <clears throat> yeah so so uh, do you have any comments on well uh, I want to get back to that the Hasmoneans and the Maccabees but the way I'll phrase it uh, I want to lead into that with with one other thing um I think it was your first academic paper in this field was on the Dead Sea Scrolls and yeah. on one particular right there was the war scroll and you mm -hmm. argued I, I haven't read the papers yet. I downloaded them um, from, uh, I think it's your, your research gate or your academia page. Um, mm -hmm. If I can, well, maybe if they're there and, but you argued that uh, this was a, this was a quite popular and influential paper. Um, I think the two of them where you argued that the war scroll was describing the, the, the situation in that, in the second century BC. Right. And yes, so, um, so I just, yes. Uh, do you, could you just comment a, a bit on, well, just that situation in general, and maybe with reference to to my comment to, uh, on the, the this conflict between the, the the Hellenistic Jews and the the kind of more um, more zealous um, radical 
Jews? Like, what's what was going on in this period? And and maybe maybe talk a bit about your paper. Sure. Uh, first, let me just uh, talk about my papers. Um, the first one was uh, um, was it Roman weaponry um, and tactics reconsidered, or something like that. I, I don't remember. Anyway, the argument was uh, the person who published the war scroll, uh, otherwise known as the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness, it described in. Uh, an apocalyptic battle at the end of time, but um, several chapters or columns of the scroll were uh, detailed military tactics for actually prosecuting this war against uh, forces of Belial and the Sons of Dark. So uh, Yigal Yadi, the famous uh, uh, Israeli general, he published the critical edition of the war scroll and he noted that there were many uh, uh, Roman features to the weaponry and formations and uh, tactics. So he dated the war scroll after 63 uh, BC when Pompey took over Judea. So he assumed that uh, that's when the Jews were exposed to all this Roman military data. My paper argued that no, um, that weapons and tactics and formations, they actually reflect the uh, Roman practices before 100 BC. Uh, he, he made, you know, he made a big mistake. Uh, it, it was second century, not first century. So, uh, uh, and, and my paper was really an instant success. Uh, and, uh, which is pretty amazing since I went up against one of the, the major people in the Dead Sea Scrolls field. Um, and then my second paper on uh, historical allusions in the, in the war scroll argued that uh, this is actually the tactical uh, military manual of the Maccabean army in, uh, in the Maccabean War of you know 166 to 163 BC. Um, and that, uh, so we have an, an actual Maccabean document. Um, I, I have a bunch of other articles that argue that many of the other Dead Sea Scrolls come out of the Maccabean era, but that's when they uh, organized uh, their community rule and this and that. But uh, I haven't published that because I got sidetracked into all of this biblical material. Uh, which is really more important. So I've got like 10 articles on the Dead Sea Scrolls on the back burner for 20 years uh, as a result. So but let's let's turn over to uh, the Hellenistic crisis, um, which led into the Maccabean War. Um, it, it's a, it, it is a paradox. In 270 BC, you have... Um, Evidently, you have some very educated uh, Jewish or Samaritan scholars who are fans of Plato and Greek philosophy, and they're using Plato's laws uh, in order to reinvent uh, Jewish society as a theocracy and, uh, and rewrite their laws and, uh, uh, and, you know, reinvent their whole society along uh, Greek lines. Um, but they did it in such a way that they attributed all of that to Moses, you know, 100 centuries earlier, and they had to more or less cover up the Greek elements in what they were doing, uh, even though they wrote this at the Great Library of Alexandria, which was the uh, capital of Greek learning in the whole world at that time. Um, so their role as authors was basically erased and history forgot the Greek background of, uh, of, of their project. Um, and the new Jewish nation, they uh, not only created the Pentateuch, but they created the, uh, the first part of, you know, the, the first version of the Hebrew Bible 
based on Plato's advice that you want to create a national library of approved texts that is considered, you know, sacred. And these are the only texts that anyone in, in the nation can read. Everything else is forbidden. You're culturally isolated. And he said, within a generation or two, if that's all they have to read, they're going to believe our foundation story. They're going to believe that uh, Moses actually created this a thousand years ago. So um, the people who wrote the Pentateuch and the Hebrew Bible, uh, they sold it as ancient, divine, not Greek. Uh, and they erased the recent uh, origins of all of this. And, and just like Plato predicted, within a couple of generations, by 200 BC, uh, you know, the Jews, according to our uh, literary sources, we have less information on the Samaritans, they, they, they believe that, you know, Moses founded their society, they had observed uh, the Torah forever, and they were fiercely, fiercely loyal to the literature and the nation and their institutions. Um, so when some people started adopting Greek customs in, you know, the 170s BC, they reacted against it violently. Um, and it created a huge crisis and, um, and led into the Maccabean War eventually. But it, it's an irony that uh, their uh, Greek origins were so thoroughly erased. Uh, and, and really, that situation continued clear into the late 20th century, where scholars have all believed in the antiquity and the basic Jewishness or you know, Middle Eastern character of the biblical writings. Um, and it was only in 1993 when Niels Peter Lemke wrote his famous article on uh, you know, the Old Testament, uh, is it a Hellenistic book? That really got people to thinking, maybe it was written later, maybe it was Greek. And then I came in on his shirt tales, uh, but I wanna give him credit. Um, and since then, since people started to consider a, a new idea and take away the assumptions and recognize them as the naked assumptions that they are, once you have that new idea, horizons open up, you know, research pours in and, and the, uh, the late Greek influences are just abundantly uh, clear and documented. Um, although many of the old school scholars have not got the memo. But, uh, but that's the power of an original idea. Uh, and it's not that you're taking this idea and you're trying to prove it. What you're doing is you're just removing an old assumption and say, let's not assume that it's uh, old when we don't have any evidence. Let's just consider the possibility that's later. And anyway, that led to rather a, a revolution that's ongoing, mm -hmm. I think, in biblical studies. Yeah, because the, the way I was, before doing the show, I was thinking about it and the, <laughs> the way I was kind of um, like framing it in my mind is that just this 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 new framing this new way of looking at things if you compare it to an old way like the some of the old ways like they account for a certain amount of data right so you look at the you look at the at the evidence the data in the text and you say okay this hypothesis can account for that whether it's okay these these ideas came from mesopotamian texts and mesopotamian mesopotamian laws and things like that but then but then when you look at it from your new, your your new framework or you know, first proposed by Lemke, is you realize, oh, well, this one can account for all of that stuff and wow. all of this stuff that no one had any idea about before, mm -hmm. at any time before. So it, 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 it opens up the horizons and it, it has a way of, of making, of making all the, all the old perspectives, um, make sense in a sense, in, in, like what they got right and why they couldn't explain other things like because if anyone you know wants to just read this book you can see how even just the specific laws you look at all of these all these 
Jewish laws, all these laws in the Pentateuch, and then you're like, oh, well, look, that's that's directly out of Plato, like the or or just the Greek laws. And mm -hmm. so you can so you can account for the similarities with the actual Greek laws as well as the the kind of Near Eastern laws. And in your previous book, the Barosis and Genesis, that's where you get more into um well, some some related but different subject matter, and there there's an explanation for that too. Um, not only was there cultural influence in the region, of course, because of where they were, but in Alexandria they had access to these books, like the the on on these laws for these regions. It's part, it was part of their research program too, is to research the laws, yeah. the existing laws, yeah. or the previous laws in the in the Near East, in the ancient Near East. So. It's just, uh, it, it can account, yeah, it's just so amazing. Um, and that's why it's so exciting. And that's why, that's why I like your books the most is because they're, they're the most like mind blowing. Like you can, hmm. you can blow open your mind and you can see all of these, all of these connections and all these cool things going on. And you're not, the, you're not the only one that's, um, that's, that's making connections like this. Um, but you're one of the, the very few, right? Um, mm -hmm. there's a book I haven't read yet recently. Um, that recently came out, uh, another by Bruce Luden, um, on, mm -hmm. cause he'd written, he'd written a book on like the, the, the literary structure of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And then he wrote a book on, oh, what was his next book? It was the, I think it was the influence of Homer on the old Testament, I think so, some yeah. of the old Testament writings. And he's, he's just had a new one that came out recently too on, I, I think it's, because I haven't read it yet, and I, I haven't looked at it too deeply, but I think it's on Homer, but also a lot of the ancient Greek um, dramatists. Yeah, and I then, think it's, it's a collection yeah. of essays, I believe, yeah. that he's brought okay. together um, that uh, go into Genesis and Judges, and he sees uh, a lot of Greek influences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to move in a slightly different direction, but on the same topic. Mm -hmm. In... There's in the last chapter in in your Plato book that that's when well because for the for for the majority of the book it's it's very like laser focused on on the on like the laws and and these these elements and in in the last chapter is when you kind of broaden the broaden the horizon broaden the broaden the scope of what you're looking at and that's when you that's when you bring up the idea that you mentioned earlier about the the Hebrew bible as this um this literary corpus this is the the national library of of this society of this culture and it was mm -hmm. created for this purpose and that plato had laid it out you want you need this kind you need several types of writings right you, you not only need the law books but you need the you need the law books to you need the laws to be embedded in stories because stories are the way that you can you can teach the laws but then you've also got in the in the bible you've got Histo more historical books and you've got the prophets and you've got the psalms so you've got you've got all these genres of literature and they've all been collected and and so i know that you've written a you've written a bit you've written bits about some of these other um genres and pieces too and one of i know one of your interests um as you've mentioned it, uh, I think you meant well. You mentioned it in our, our previous interview, but also also the other interviews you've, you've done is to find the the elements in the books that were incorporated into this Bible that previously existed. So, so for mm -hmm. example, a lot of these psalms probably were pre-existing psalms, and they were just yeah. um, incorporated and maybe maybe modified. But but it's like here's the existing song. Let's let's incorporate this, and probably some books too. Um, I want to. I want you to just speak for a bit about that, and maybe have you made any have you made any recent discoveries along that line, or you know have you identified mm -hmm. um, any any books that you think oh well or or this section or this this book will actually was like pre existing for a while maybe um, well just anything along those lines. Oh yeah, yeah. No, um, part of my research is to find the date when these books were finally created. But part of it that's just as interesting is to find the older materials. Um, now, one obvious uh, set of older materials are the royal annals of Israel and Judah that are embedded in the books of First and Second Kings. 
um, those uh, the dates and names of these kings are oftentimes uh, verified from Assyrian or Babylonian records. Uh, so we know that goes back to uh, uh, Iron II or uh, you know monarchy uh, uh, sources, and um, contains some uh, valuable information. Now, um, of course, they're synchronized. Um, you know, the um, every king of Israel is dated in terms of, you know, in the fourth year of king so-and-so of Judah and back and forth. Now, this synchronizing of chronologies, that didn't start until um, Timaeus of Tarominium, who was a Greek uh, chronographer. And uh, he was very popular at the Great Library of Alexandria. It's known that uh, his works were used there in the 270s BC. And he had a, a systematic chronology that correlated priests and kings and this and that, like six different sources aligned in parallel. And you have something similar going on in the book of Kings and Jeremiah, where the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah, and uh, the kings of Babylon, and uh, in one case, an Egyptian king, are, are correlated in this unified synchronous so anyway you have these ancient sources but they've been remade in light of the latest uh cutting edge greek uh, chronography so there's one example uh, another example from the book of kings first kings uh, is the acts of solomon which is cited as a source text so um uh, Thomas Thomson, the, the great uh, uh, minimalist from, you know, of the Copenhagen School, uh, he recently had a festschrift, uh, a collection of papers in his honor. And I was invited to contribute. And um, I argued in my paper that the Acts of Solomon um, are a, a valid ancient source. Uh, you know, it's based on a, mem a memorial inscription. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the ruler uh, was not Jewish. Uh, he was the Assyrian king, Shalmaneser III. And, uh, you know, some of the data from the first few chapters in uh, First Kings about Solomon's reign, you can find that in some of his inscriptions. Um, and he had he had the kingdom beyond the Euphrates clear down to uh, Israel, and he had the harems, and he, um, you know, right down the line, there's all sorts of correlations. So um, that's a really fascinating example of an ancient source document um, in Kings, which we can kind of verify, but you still have to read it critically. You know, there was no united monarchy. Uh, the uh, what happened was around 725 BC, the Assyrians conquered Samaria, and um, it became an Assyrian province, Samarina. They brought in Babylonians. They had Assyrian overlords, um, and Shalmaneser the third had uh, he was the first conqueror in that area from Assyria, and he had monuments. And he was their big hero. So you have these Assyrians and Babylonians who look to Shalmaneser III as their founder. And uh, the Babylonians, they didn't disappear out of Samaria. They continued with their national identity and, and memories and ethnicity clear down into the Hellenistic era. And, this, and they carried this document along with them. And there's a lot of Babylonian uh, and Assyrian material hmm. in the Hebrew Bible. Would the um, the Enoch material with Enoch material fit in there? Uh, yes, that uh, especially the astronomical book of Enoch, which uh, develops a lot of theories of astronomy, and uh, um, in that in that portion, which is uh, the book of First Enoch, chapters seventy-two to eighty-two. Um, 
Enoch received these revelations from this angel Uriel, or Uriel, I don't know how to pronounce Uriel, I guess, about uh, how the um, how the constellations were organized and how many weeks in a year and a 360 day year and all sorts of astronomical material. And um, I haven't published this yet. So this is breaking news. I, I'm, I'm breaking it on your show. Mm -hmm. um, but this, uh, this Jewish document uh, is it actually didn't start out as Jewish. It's a Mesopotamian document. It was written in Aramaic by um, Mesopotamian scholars living in Samaria. They continued their scientific uh, traditions. Um, and the Book of Enoch uh, attributes all sorts of uh, Mesopotamian knowledge to uh, the Watchers and their revelations. Uh, and uh, there's been studies that have shown that all these categories of revealed secrets are actually standard Mesopotamian scholarship. But uh, anyway, scholars have assumed, though, that all this Enoch stuff, uh, that the Jews somehow acquired um, Mesopotamian scholarship and wrote these documents. And um, in, in a book that's a couple books down the road, I'll show that <clears throat> the astronomical book of Enoch is not Jewish at all. And it was actually, it, the oldest layers of it were, uh, were purely uh, Babylonian, Mesopotamian. Hmm. Um, you know, they, scholars know they draw, they, it, they, it draws on Mole Apen and uh, the Anu Elisha, uh, some scholarly documents of the Mesopotamian uh, astronomers, but they assumed that uh, somehow Jewish authors got a hold of these foreign materials. Um, it's, it's really um, um, a common assumption that um, the Jewish library, the Jewish writings, the Hebrew Bible, um, you know, it, they're all in possession. They're part of the, the uh, national heritage of the ancient Jewish nation. So it's been assumed that they're written by uh, Jews or Samaritans. But there's a lot of um, material from other nations. There's Egyptian proverbs in the book of Proverbs. There's uh, some Egyptian material in the book of Psalms is well known. Um, one of my favorite examples uh, that I haven't published on again um, is the first chapter of Ezekiel, where he had the uh, vision of God's throne with the cherubim and the wheels and the, uh, the you know, the sapphire uh, floor and, uh, you know, God on his chariot, all of this stuff. It, it was so exotic that the rabbis, forbid people, uh, you know, students from discussing it unless there were, you know, certain authorities around because it was so far out there. Um, and scholars have noted that there's a lot of parallels between this vision and a, um, a Babylonian text dealing with Marduk's throne in the heavens uh, he had his chariot. He had, you know, all of this stuff. So um, that whole chapter started out as a as a Babylonian document. It's a Marduk text. Hmm. There's hmm. like one verse, one verse in it that mentions Yahweh, and it's part of an editorial thread that runs clear through, through the Book of Ezekiel. And uh, plus, there's the first two verses that says. Oh, Ezekiel saw this uh, by the river Kibar in the year that's and such. Other than that, there's no mention of Yahweh, and it's this exotic uh, Mesopotamian material that has been domesticated by the late authors of Ezekiel uh, by saying that um, the prophet Ezekiel saw all this stuff. But they just... They took this uh, Mesopotamian Marduk text 
and uh, said, well, this isn't really Marduk, it's Yahweh. So there's a lot of that stuff that goes on, and I find that just as fascinating, this older material, as, mm-hmm. uh, as the later uh, material. Yeah, yeah, me too. And and the reason, one of the reasons I find it so fascinating is if 270 BC or 272, around that, around those few years, if that's when the 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 original the original final form of the of the library the pentateuch was formed then that opens the question well in 280 bc what did things look like you know what were what was what was this entire society what did they believe what did they practice and it just it opens up the it open again it opens up the the dimensions for for research and for for speculation because we've got things like the elephantine papyri like you mentioned mm-hmm. but um mm-hmm. but when you look well this is where we can get into the documentary hypothesis a bit because so when we're looking at the, the elements that went into the pentateuch we see that there are some some disparate voices there are some some contradictions there are some some different perspectives that all get amalgamated so so it wasn't it wasn't just one group of people who all thought the same thing that decided, okay, we're going to do this. It was, there was some stuff, there was some meshing going on. There was some, some, uh, some negotiations going on for how, how this was going to be done. So maybe we'll, we can use this as a transition to the documentary hypothesis. So, so I'll introduce it a bit and then we'll get into um, your recent paper on the subject. So the documentary hypothesis. So this was again, um, what, 200 years ago? Was that around when we could say that the documentary hypothesis started maybe 150 years? I think it was in well, the... It, it, it developed... Boy, someone's on my roof with a blower. Uh, <laughs> so I hope I hope you don't well, hear all of that going on. Um, the documentary hypothesis really developed from about, uh, say, the late 1700s to approaching 1900. It really got crystallized with Julius Wellshausen's uh, uh, polygamy. Now, you know, anyway, his his big book on the documentary mm-hmm. hypothesis. Okay. Uh, so, oh, go ahead. And it was kind of the regnant, you know, the reigning theory throughout most of the 20th century, although it fell into disfavor in, in the last few decades mm-hmm. uh, because they saw a few cracks in the logic. Mm-hmm. So. So as just a bit of background, the, the idea basically is that what, what happened was people, the, the original, the original motivation for this, the original, like, like evidence was the different names of God. And it's like, oh, well, sometimes they use Elohim and sometimes they use Yahweh. And then that developed to the point where, where uh, eventually the scholarship could recognize like um, some, some threads going through the entire Pentateuch where it's like, where this, this section seems to to go with this section, which goes with this section. And it was essentially as if around four documents or more or way more, um, depending on who the scholar was, were like interleaved with each other yeah. and, and just jammed together. So some, some, so like three different, three different sources would tell the same story or two sources would tell the same story. And then they'd either, um, if they were different enough, they'd put them as like side by side or separate them. But if they were obviously talking, like telling the same story or just a different version of it, then they just took the, took the accounts and went like this with them, like, poof. Yep. and you can, you can identify these, 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 str- these, uh, these threads that, that go throughout the entire Pentateuch and the, but that that so there's a literary dimension, which is just looking at how these literary texts fixed, fit fit together and how you can disentangle them. But then there was also the historical argument that was like, um, I, I think it was Wellshausen as well who had two two books. It might have been one of the other big guys, but he had two books: one on the literary method, and, and then the second one was on the historic the like the history. And he had this entire this whole theory, or well, these theories developed where you had the original like uh, you had. An, like the first version of Judaism, and that led to to the to like the J te- the the J text, the Yahwist text, right. and then it developed later on. You know, over hundreds of years, it developed into this text, and then hundreds of so it was. You were looking at stages in the in the mm-hmm. Hebrew religion, and then, like you said, people poked holes in this and said, "Well, that doesn't really work," and how and you can't really. It's it's impossible to actually date these texts to the point now where. A lot of people are saying, well, you, you, you can't say that you, you can, you, it's very hard to say that one was prior to the other because it's all, all 
the, the only way to get there is to engage in circular reasoning. You, you mm -hmm. assume that that one was the, the first one, and then you can develop an argument for how it developed. But there's no evidence to show that that, that, that document was actually the, the first one anyways. And um, I, I read a, a really interesting book that I enjoyed, that I greatly enjoyed recently. Uh, I want to know if you've read it, uh, Joel Baden's The Composition of the Pentateuch. Have you read that one? Um, I think I've heard of it, but I don't think I've read okay. it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll recommend it. He's, he, he is uh, uh, a young scholar. Um, he's got a, f a few colleagues, mm -hmm. I think. There are a few people that are working in that direction. And he's kind of reinvigorating the, the documentary hypothesis. But mm -hmm. he, he is doing so in such a way as to, well, I'll, I'll lay out his conclusion, first of all. His conclusion mm -hmm. are that there are four basic documentary documents like that, that make up the Pentateuch. But you you cannot make any historical um, judgments on these on these books. It's it's virtually impossible. Um, all like for the way, um, well, how to summarize how to, how to summarize it in the best way. The analysis is almost strictly literary, and I think he uh -huh. he argues that you can own that the only um, temporal or yeah, the only temporal argument you can make or a chronological argu argument you can make is that one of the books like definitely makes use of the other book. I think it's like Deuteronomy obviously makes use of the E source because they right. or or was it the P? it was either J, E or P probably. Yeah. Um because J, it, J and it, P. Yeah, because it uses I think it might have been P then because um whenever it quotes uh whenever it relates an account of one of the stories that takes place in the previous books, it's always this other story uh, or this other book's version. Right. And so he, uh, he, um, some of his, some of his points are controversial and disagree with other, other scholarship where he says, well, no, this isn't P this is actually, you know, E or something. And so, so he doesn't always, he doesn't always agree with the previous scholarship, like with uh, Thomas Friedman, for instance. Um, whose book is really great because you can you the the Bible with R sources R revealed Richard Elliot Friedman R yeah. Richard Elliot Friedman yeah yeah sorry did I say Thomas Friedman yeah yeah no that's the that's the political commentator you know, guy. is he okay I, I didn't know who he was <laughs> no no oh so um yeah Richard Elliot so so I read your your paper on the documentary hypothesis well well first um, well I I I, I highly recommend his book because I think it's really well written and I think it's got some implications for some of the things that that um, that you write in your paper I will state one of his one of his um, conclusions before before going moving on to your paper and getting you to talk about it one of the things he says um, now I don't think I don't th I don't think he would go totally minimal minimalist or to a Hellenistic era dating I'm not sure based on the things I've I've heard from him in interviews and read in his book but what he does say in in his book on the documentary hypothesis is that for all we know the four sources could have been composed like within five minutes of each other like contemporaneously really, really? Yeah. yes yeah now he's not arguing that that's the case he's mm -hmm. just saying that that we can't we can't say that's not the case it, it mm -hmm. it's just it could be possible so there's an opening there for um, w that ties into your paper. Um, so now yeah. we can get to that. So could you just uh, tell us a bit about your perspective on the documentary hypothesis and what you say in this new paper? Sure. Uh, my paper is, can the documentary hypothesis be rehabilitated? And it was published in the Journal of uh, Higher Criticism, which uh, the editor there is Robert Price. He's a very respected scholar. Um, I first go through a lot of the evidence that suggests that there are multiple sources, uh, which you've already sort of, you know, the doublets, the uh, certain themes, uh, the use of certain divine names. So it's credible that uh, there are different voices or sources. Um, but it's always been a naked assumption, once again, that each one of these sources represented a different era, you know, that. Uh, the J source was initially thought to be like uh, 900s um, BC, and the E source was 800s BC, and 
<clears throat> Deuteronomy was uh, you know 516 BC, and the priestly source was 450 BC. You know Ezra. So uh, it's always been an assumption that uh, they were from different time periods, and uh, my papers are you know argues that uh, that's that's not a valid assumption. Uh, for one thing, when you look at where one source does use another source. Okay, there's lots of documented instances of that. Uh, but in some cases, uh, J, the Yahweh, uses E, the Elohis. Uh, and sometimes E uses J. Now, how can J use E and E use J? Well, if they were contemporary. Um, the same is true with uh, J and P. Um, P, the priestly source, I think is very dramatic in this respect um, because most of the priestly stories, uh, they, they don't even form a connected whole. And um, they, they obviously use J and maybe E, some of the earlier materials. But on the other hand, uh, and, th and this was Weldhausen's position that it was the latest. But on the other hand, uh, P is responsible for the, the Toledot uh, structure of Genesis, the, the Toledot or generations, where he talks about the generations of Adam, the generations of Noah, so on and so forth. Um, that's the chronological framework for all of Genesis. Uh, and that's P, and that's utilized by J and E. So uh, before Wellhausen, because of this uh, generation structure, P was, they said it has to be the earliest uh, because everyone else uses that structure. And then Wellhausen said, yeah, but the stories are all used. To, uh, so P is both the earliest and the latest. Now, how is that possible unless they're contemporary? It's his own grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is his own grandmother. Um, <laughs> Another another thing is sometimes you can't separate uh, the the different sources. For instance, in the Joseph uh, novella, the Joseph story, it's clearly got some J materials. It's clearly got E materials. But if you and, and it's a beautiful novel, hangs together, a great story. If you separate the J and the E, neither story makes sense. You know, it destroys both of them. Uh, there are other places where you can't even intelligibly separate the sources. Uh, it's just a mishmash of J and E and P phrases. Um, and my interpretation of that is that, uh, you know, some of the, that J and E and P and the Deuteronomist, they all represent contemporary authorial groups. We don't know how many people were in each group, but they're different voices. And uh, sometimes they were in the same room. You know, the J and E people, they get together in the same room and they collaborated and they came up with the Joseph story. Um, and sometimes you have all three of them uh, working together. Uh, and then um, the Deuteronomist, uh, yes, uh, he, he seems to be the latest. Um, he he uses some of the other materials. But on the other hand, you have some uh, Deuteronomistic uh, editing going on in Genesis. So he's he's and his law code sometimes seems a little earlier than some of the material in Exodus. So you know, there's arguments that he is also uh, part of that contemporary group as well. Now, um, in my historical model. Um, the Pentateuch was written by, uh, on invitation from Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who invited uh, representatives of the Jews and Samaritans to Alexandria because he'd heard rumors of these laws of Moses and he wanted a copy for his, uh, for the great library. So you, uh, the tradition says that there were 70 scholars who came to Alexandria and that they uh, 
translated the books of Moses into into Greek. Well, um, part of that's just legend, but the part where there was a, a delegation of multiple scholars that came to Alexandria and created the books of Moses, uh, I, I find that quite credible. And some of those scholars represent J and some of them are E and some are D and P. And uh, uh, so you have this collaborative effort. Uh, I don't know who the, the ringmaster was. I don't know who the referee was, but somebody was getting all these different literary contributions um, and saying, listen, guy, I'm not going to, I'm not going to choose yours over theirs. I'll make it all work together somehow. And, you know, and they sewed it all together. Uh, I, I like how you did it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and we get the Pentateuch as a result. Um, but I see it all happening uh, in 270 BC, the collaborative groups. I agree that sometimes one of the authors uses the other author's material. Uh, but um, all that shows is that the other author, you know, finished his material five minutes before the other guy. Uh, you can't mm. tell how much time is between these different versions. Right, right. The, but I'll have to we, read Baden, though, because, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I really recommend it because I think, well, his perspective, his approach is slightly um, different yeah. than a lot of the previous guys. Um, one of the... His main thing is is not to focus on the language, as in the words. So he thinks it's a misguided approach to start with the linguistic evidence, to say, oh, well, E uses this word, so anytime you, we find this word in the entire Pentateuch, it must be an E source or an E sentence. He says, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. um, those can be hints, they can be confirmation of like a tendency. Yeah. So, you know, E might... Uh, e might tend to use this word more often, but just because that word is used, is used, uh, or that just because that word is used, that doesn't mean that the any particular sentence must be e. He says his approach is to to look at it literarily and historically. So if if a if a document makes a historical claim, for example, the tent of meeting is in the the middle of the of the the community, then then you can you can find all of the stories and all the sentences where the tent the, the the meeting tent is in the middle and they'll all be from the same source and then you mm -hmm. you say oh wow the the story actually makes sense when you follow all that together and then in, and then in all of the other instances the tent is on the outside of the community or just outside the community so he says you should look at it as if you're looking at four different like no novels or stories and mm -hmm. you look at the characterization you look at the the events as they occur and and the themes as they as they weave in and out and and he argues that you'll make a much better and more coherent division of sources once you do that so yeah i'll i'll, I'll recommend you you check that yeah. book out because i think it'll i think that there might be some stuff in there too that will mesh with yours even if he doesn't necessarily argue yeah. what you're arguing there's mm -hmm. some uh compatibility there but when you're telling the story about the or when you're telling your perspective on the historical um, circumstances of the composition in alexandria i just had i just had a funny image that i wanted to share so when when i was sure. in college taking a music uh taking music one of the one of the bits of, of advice from one of the professors was okay now when, when you're a professional musician so you're going to get gigs right so you're going to get offers to 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 play to in, in, a, in a certain environment now if if someone asks can you play this always say yes <laughs> they say um don't no. say no, say yes. And then you work your ass off to learn it before the gig, right? So you just, mm -hmm. you just say, you pretend you can do anything. And then if you mm -hmm. can't actually do it, then you practice and practice and you make sure you can do it because you want that gig. So I just had this image of the, of, um, was it Ptolemy or something saying, oh, yeah. I, we heard that you have these great laws, you know, come, we, we must put them in our library. And then the, the 70 elders being like, oh, Oh, and then it would make a great satirical movie where these where these guys get roped into coming to Alexandria to present their their laws, and they actually don't have them written yet. And so it's yeah. it's all about it's all about putting one over on on the, the just a uh, yeah. If anyone out there, you know, it's a free idea if you want to go to Hollywood with it, but uh, well, unlikely. <laughs> so 
Okay, so we've we've covered the documentary hypothesis. We've got that down. We've got that figured out um, 100%. So, so um, moving, maybe we, let's move on. Okay. Or first of all, how much time do you have, Russell? Um, I'm, you You're know, good? my time is your time. Excellent. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, because we've got a few, a few other things that I definitely want to get to. Maybe, okay. maybe this is a good time to, to move into your upcoming release. You've got a new book coming out relatively soon. We, I don't know if, if we have a release date yet, but can you tell us about your new book? And yeah, just tell us about your new book. What can we expect? Sure. First off, uh, I'm going to switch over to the document that's the title page. Because um, my, my titles are a paragraph long, so I'll, I'll give you the title. Here, here it is. Um, Plato's Timaeus and the Biblical Creation Accounts, Cosmic Monotheism and Terrestrial Polytheism in the Primordial History. Now, um, okay, so the Primordial History is Genesis 1 through 11. It's like its own little separate document about the world down to the time of Noah. Um, and my next book, um, deals with, we know that Plato was a source for a lot of the mosaic uh, laws. Um, this book explores a different uh, couple works by Plato and how they influenced Genesis 1 through 3 especially. Um, Plato's Timaeus was his account of the uh, origins of the universe, the cosmos. Um, he had uh, an eternal God, a cosmic creator named the Demiurge or craftsman. And he um, had this material world that was just utter chaos and darkness and there weren't elements and it was a mixed up mesh, mess. And he fashioned it into um, the beautiful universe we have. Um, and so Timaeus has this um, um, philosopher explaining the theory as to how the universe came about. And um, my book is going to show that that follows, you know, right down the line with Genesis 1, that Plato's Timaeus was a major source for the first creation account. Now, as everybody knows, there were uh, two creation accounts. The second creation account is in Genesis 2, uh, where, you know, the first one is Elohim, who created the world in seven days, six days, rather. The second one is Yahweh Elohim, who is living in the Garden of Eden, and he... Uh, he makes Adam and Eve and Tree of Knowledge and all that stuff. Um, so chapter one is usually attributed to the P source, the priestly source, and chapter two and three to the Yahweh. Two different creation accounts. Uh, no, it's all the same connected narrative. Um, because in Plato's Timaeus, First, you have the craftsman creating the beautiful cosmos and the heavens and the, you know, all of that. Uh, but he doesn't create life forms because everything that he creates is perfect and good and immortal. So he has, uh, has a bunch of sons and daughters and he says, okay, I'm retiring. I'm going to go rest. I am. Uh, I've done my labors. I've created the universe. The left, the rest, I'm leaving up to you. You guys, you little terrestrial Greek gods and goddesses wandering around on Earth, you have to create everything that's alive because uh, I am really immortal. And you're kind of semi-immortal. <clears throat> you're fairly reasonably immortal because I created you. You're my offspring. 
Uh, so anything I create is going to exist forever. Uh, but anything you create, since you're only immortal because of my will, and you're not really intrinsically immortal, anything you create could be mortal and die, you know? And uh, it's beneath me. I'm going to let you do all that stuff. So uh, Timaeus has a second creation account, as it were, <clears throat> where these the younger gods, the offspring of the creator, uh, they create mortal life. Uh, there's a lot of problems with mortal life because um, it's made out of matter, so there's a potentiality for wickedness, you know, especially with those humans. And, uh, uh, you know, it deals with the whole theme of um, theodicy, you know, is God responsible for human wickedness? All of this stuff comes right out of Plato's Timaeus. Um, and it's it, uh, and Yahweh was not the cosmic creator in Genesis. There was an eternal creator who made the universe in six days or fashioned it. And then Yahweh is one of these dinky gods wandering around in the Garden of Eden. There's lots of sons of gods. You have other sons of gods who are marrying. Uh, you know, beautiful women in Genesis 6. Um, and he's one of these lesser gods. So um, Plato had this system where he was interested in this monotheistic uh, cosmic god. That was his deal as a philosopher. <clears throat> but he wasn't going to say that the Greek gods didn't exist because he'd be tried for atheism and, you know, executed like Socrates. So he allowed for the existence of regular terrestrial Greek gods. And, uh, but he said they all had to get along. There's harmony among all the gods. Everything was peaceful. And so he had this cosmic monotheism. Um, at the creation of the cosmos. And then he had this benevolent polytheism thereafter where all the gods played nice with each other. So that's where the title of my book comes from. Hmm. Um, and part of my book shows that Jewish monotheism uh, came from Plato. You know, his story of this one God in existence at the dawn of the universe. That's where Jewish monotheism eventually came from. Um, so that's the keen insight. Everyone's been assuming, you know, it comes from Persian Zoroastrianism or, or whatever, but um, it's really highlighting uh, Plato's role, which I should mention, uh, Philippe uh, Wadenbaum uh, in his Argonauts of the Desert. He had previously uh, said that Plato was responsible for uh, monotheism, uh, but this book confirms that. Hmm, cool. When's the? Do you have a potential release date yet? Publication date? Well, I sent the. Okay, I finished the manuscript last October. Sent it to Copenhagen. They sent it to Rutledge. It was approved. But there were some there were reviewers who gave me feedback. So for the last year, I've been revising the whole manuscript in light of that feedback. Uh, this October 1st, I sent the revised manuscript to Copenhagen and Rutledge. Now my editor has a few last things she wants to tweak. <laughs> so uh, it's due at Rutledge in three weeks. Okay. That's that's the hard and fast deadline, <clears throat> and then that'll take a month, a month or two probably to uh, get into print. Excellent. So maybe okay. a, if if not a Christmas present, then maybe a New Year present. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's very exciting. It's, it's a major cool. book. <clears throat> I should mention too. I tend I tend to lose my voice in these interviews. Um, I mentioned, too, that along with Timaeus, 
Plato wrote a sequel called Critias, where he told the story of Atlantis. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he foreshadows it in Critias. He says, you know, we're going to tell the story of Atlantis, but first let's talk about the origins of the universe. So in Critias, he tells the story of Atlantis. And my book also argues that Atlantis, which was destroyed for wickedness, uh, went down in earthquakes and flood. That uh, this was the basis of uh, the biblical flood, as as it's recounted in uh, Genesis six. I mean, Critias has marriages between the gods and uh, human women and offspring and degeneration and wickedness and divine judgment and floods. Anyway, this this is a, I, I love the fact that biblical scholars from here on out are going to have to bring up Atlantis when they talk about, <laughs> about the Genesis story. <laughs> oh, yes, that's great. That's great. <laughs> okay, well, we'll leave, maybe we'll leave that there as a, as a, uh, a sneak peek to the book. Yeah. As soon as it comes out, I'm going to be reading it as fast as possible, and then we'll have you back on to sure. to talk about the new book and get into mm-hmm. it in detail. Um, so there were, I think, two more things. Unless unless we get distracted by something else, there were two more things I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Um, now, I, I'm interested in your background a bit because um, because you're not you don't have a PhD in biblical studies or anything like this. You, like you're an independent scholar. So I'm I'm. I'm interested. How did you, how did you start? Like, what what was the impetus? What was your intellectual journey to to write that first paper and to and to then move on into more biblical stuff as opposed to the Dead Sea Scrolls? Like, how did how did you get there? Um, well, I'll tell you the I'll tell you the original impetus. Um, grade school, high school, I read a lot of detective stories. Great ones, you know, Sherlock Holmes. Father Brown Mysteries, and I was fascinated um, by mysteries because you go into it, it's impossible. You know, the facts that you're presented, they're impossible. They don't make sense. And then, um, especially G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown Mysteries, he found a way to go into the impossibility to figure out the hypothesis of what must have happened. And then once you find out what what happened, everything makes sense. Every detail falls into place. It's like a gestalt, aha, Uh, you know, and and that psychological experience um, was uh, very significant for me. um, Because I learned what a mystery is, how to recognize when you get a mystery and how to solve it and then what the standards are that you know you've solved it. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, he always had his plotting police detectives who would get out a hammer and hammer a few facts into place and uh, say, you know, it's so-and-so. And, you know, he always came up with the explanation that really made sense. And scholarship is, today is, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of plodding uh, <laughs> policemen out there. So. And what was, what was Sherlock Holmes? What was the, the main guy's name? Uh, the inspector, inspector something or. Oh. Um, oh, I had it yesterday. I don't anymore. Yeah. yeah but yeah. Uh, anyways, when you were saying that, I was thinking, oh, so, <laughs> so that, that, that's what, those are, those are your academic, um, um, appears, I'll say, or or yeah, the opposition yeah. or the, the so, competition. So mm-hmm. I've studied every form of logic from mathematical, symbolic, FBI profiling, you name it. But uh, the detective story really takes logic and raises it to an art form. So uh, I thought growing up, you know, I'd, I'd love to do detective stuff. But Detective stories, they always seem like a cheat because the author, they know who did it and how they did it before they even start. So I wanted to look into some real mysteries. And the ancient world has lots of great mysteries. And um, 
Well, well, religion, you know, has lots of mysteries. They promote mysteries. They thrive on mysteries. But I, I take a mystery and I, I don't get all uh, intuitive about it. I, uh, I want to solve it. So anyway, so then um, I did go to Bible college. So that gave me a very good grounding in uh, the text. Uh, but I, I, I left that whole scene. Uh, you know, there's whole decades when I forget that I went to, uh, <clears throat> to Bible college back in the day. <laughs> It's true, I did. Um, uh, later, I got into um, the Greek classics, and uh, oh, I tackled a few mysteries there. I worked on a book called In Search of the Pillars of Hercules, um, and this and that. So, anyway, one day I was reading uh, Barossus, who's this Babylonian priest who wrote the history of Babylon from creation through the 10 kings before the flood and the flood hero and all the kings since then. And I was reading him for my other research and I thought, wow, that reads exactly like Genesis. Um, but Genesis was written so much earlier and Barossus was written in 280 BC. I'll, I'll file that under interesting and uh, think about it. And then I ran across Neil Peter Lemke, who said, you know, maybe this stuff is a lot later than anyone imagined. And so then I took my uh, classical reading and my Barossa studies, <clears throat> and I decided to test which came first, you know, Barossa or Genesis. And uh, you know, and that led into Manetho and all sorts of research. And I just wrote this book because I was interested. And I sent it off to my friend, Greg Doudna, and, uh, who was a student at the University of Copenhagen at the time. And he read it and he said, and he just said, my, my professor Thomas Thompson needs to read this. And he just gave him the manuscript. I didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> and Thompson, read it and said, uh, you know, we got to publish this. And uh, ever since then, you know, anything I write, basically, they'll publish. Uh, so that's how that's how it happened. In the meantime, I had written some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and been invited to uh, International Congress and stuff like that. But, you know, that's that's how it all happened. I'm just really curious. And uh, I love to investigate and research, and I have this talent for uh, solving things. Don't mm -hmm. tell anyone, don't tell my academic friends, by the way, that I'm a historical detective. You know, they think I'm an underground academic or something. Oh, that, that's amazing. You know, that, thank you. Um, and I, th I think that, I think that that collection of influences and, um, and experiences has has gone to the the it's it was it was the perfect co combination of influences and experiences to create this the ultimate historical detective um you're like you're kind of like indiana jones but you stay in the office right and uh, you just stay in the library yeah stay in the library uh, and i think well that, i do nowadays i used to rock climb i oh yeah i i'd stand on rooftops I, so you, so you, so you are in the, <laughs> so you are in Indiana no, Jones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, your your book is a perfect, uh, yeah. Plato and the creation of the Hebrew Bible is a, a perfect um, manifestation of what you were uh, wanting to achieve. I think um, just by the way that you were describing your 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 influences and what you were hoping to do and what really excited you that's what uncovering like a real mystery uh and and getting to the truth of the matter that's what it can really do is, is blow wide open um all of these previous assumptions and, and open up a whole new world of possibilities and um so like great job because you know you nailed you nailed it um in terms of what you were trying to do with uh you know, being a, a detective. Mm -hmm. 
So if we want to move on to um, something else that is uh, very interesting about you, your father was in the CIA um, and you have some, some bits and pieces on, on the internet about uh, how he was uh, bringing defectors from the Soviet Union. It was like the, the, ja the James Bond of the CIA or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, is, that's not me talking. Uh, the journalist Tom Mangold said that he was the closest thing that the CIA had to James Bond at the time, which is really true. He, uh, he was captured by the KGB in Baghdad. Um, when he was about to leave Baghdad for the U.S., his counterpart had him kidnapped, um, offered him a suitcase of money if he would turn to the KGB, you know, and be their agent. And he said, well, you know what? I'll offer you two suitcases of money if you turn to the become our agent and you know they kind of back and forth but <laughs> he had all sorts of really amazing he had a false flag uh, undercover work and uh um it was quite amazing quite a career now did he what was his his story was he uh, i'm it, it's been a while since i checked the page but yeah. Um, cause is your family ori originally Russia or Russian? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm half Russian, actually, uh, Cossack specifically. Um, my grandfather was, um, uh, he was in, he was an official in the, uh, Russian embassy in Urumqi in Xinjiang province in China when the Ruff Russian revolution broke out. So um, I haven't figured out if he went back to fight, uh, at the, you know, against the communist revolution or not. But I know that after the uprising, he, he was still in Xinjiang province. He rose to become a minister of communication and the right-hand man of uh, Governor Yang. Uh, and he was one of the most important people in the province. Then there was um, a Muslim uprising in the early 30s. And this, uh, this warlord uh, besieged Urumqi. Um, and my grandfather managed to get my grandmother and her three children uh, out of the city by caravan uh, to the Gobi Desert to escape all of this. And uh, there were numerous adventures. Their caravan was kidnapped. They were held for ransom, this and that. But eventually, they they escaped. My my grandfather was executed, um, but they escaped. They made it to the U.S. And because the family had such uh, prestige in what they call white Russian uh, circles, Cossacks, that uh, eventually they were. Uh, my father and also my uncle were employed by the CIA. My father, for uh, he did a lot of debriefing of Russians who came into America, and he got into intelligence work and had all sorts of wonderful adventures. So, uh, yeah. so my grandfather, my father, they're like these kind of famous people that history hasn't heard of. And uh, I don't know if I'm repeating the pattern or not, but uh, but yeah, yeah he, he was he was very suave and very James Bond like. That's that's very cool. Um, well, you've got you've at least got books to send out through history. Mm -hmm. The you know yeah. spies spies their work often uh, you know never gets acknowledged. That's true. Um, yeah, but so you maybe just really briefly we'll wrap up in a few minutes but um mm -hmm. before we started recording you were telling me that uh telling us that you only learned about this in when you were a teenager so was uh, so what was life like in the in the first years um with your dad w like was there mystery surrounding what he did or did he have like cover stories for you guys what was the, how how was that well he um 
Well, first off, my parents split up um, when I was about six, and I okay. I moved back with my mother back on the farm. She was originally a farm girl, but a very sophisticated, well-read, beautiful, all of you know. But so I. I had spent time in Japan, I spent time in Washington, D.C., and then I wound up on the farm. Um, so I'm kind of schizophrenic in that respect. Um, <clears throat> so um, I heard that uh, he was employed by uh, the State Department, which is true. So he'd be <clears throat> stationed in Nepal, <clears throat> or Kenya or different places around the world. And he was basically uh, a State Department official. And then um, I finally got to spend <clears throat> about a year with him when I was almost in high school. And uh, I must relate one amusing anecdote. By then I'd found out that he worked for the CIA. But on, on the road trip from Klamath Falls, Oregon to Washington, D.C. Um, we were driving along. He was speeding as usual. And a uh, uh, secret agent man comes on the radio. He was a big hit at the time. <laughs> and he really, he was really grooving to it. He was rocking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I found hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. That's awesome. <laughs> well, maybe um, when we have you on again to discuss your new book, we'll uh, we'll see if if you have any other any any other dad stories or um, or anything that you discovered, you know, in the intervening sure. time. <laughs> All right. So I think yeah. we'll we'll end it there. We'll give your voice a rest, Russell, and thank you yeah, so thanks. much. Yeah. Thank you. It's been uh, it's been a blast. I'm uh, we covered a lot of ground, um, we but did. We covered a lot of ground in little bite sized pieces. So I hope that I hope that viewers and listeners will go to your website, check out your books, check out your articles, check out your other interviews because there's so much more. Oh, maybe one. Uh, let's let's end on one final thing. Um, in addition to your to your new book on cosmic monotheism and uh, terrestrial polytheism in the primordial history. Did I get that right? Oh, <laughs> the, okay. Awesome. In addition to that, what's uh, what's the, what's another project you either have coming out soon, like maybe a paper or the next one that you plan? Um, well, I'm working on two books right now. Um, both of them are about half, half written, maybe more. One of them is called uh, Barosis and Kings, and it shows how Barosis the Babylonian um, priest who was very influential in the first few chapters of Genesis, and he was also used as a historical source in the Book of Kings, mm -hmm. and I uh, also bring out, you know, other Syrian sources and this and that. So um, Thomas Thompson has been after me to write that book for a couple decades, and I'm I'm going to do it. And the other book I'm working on is my first. Um, popular, general audience, affordable, you know, uh, book called Who Really Wrote the Bible? And it's going to kind of summarize uh, my, my past two books. And, uh, and I get, I don't have to have a footnote for every other sentence. So it's just liberating fun reading and it kind of has a detective story motif that follows the clues and uh it, it's a fun fun project cool. great can't wait mm -hmm. so thank you so much russell gamirkin this is his previous book plato and the creation of the hebrew bible check out his website for everything else thanks again and take care we'll talk to you again soon Bye-bye.